The following recording is a verbatim reading of a witness statement by Sheila Caffell's friend and confidant, Freddie Imani. Extracts of this statement were read at the trial, however none of these contained his account of Sheila's violent outbursts or the psychotic episodes he described. About four years ago, I met Sheila Caffell. At this time, she was living in a basement flat at Hampstead with her two sons. We met at a party that was thrown by a mutual friend and got on well together, purely as friends. We enjoyed each other's company, and I believe Sheila needed someone to talk to when a decision needed to be made. From the first time I met her, she struck me as being a little slow, Unable to grasp simple things and the sort of person who relied on others to make decisions. She would bring her problems to me and we would discuss them. These problems were mainly family or money worries. I would say I have never been Sheila's boyfriend, more a confidant. Someone she could burden her problems with. Sometime after our relationship started, I met Sheila's father and stepmother. We got on very well. Her father expressed concern over Sheila's flat and its conditions, well, they were damp, and asked if I could help her to find a new flat. I agreed, and eventually found for her her present flat in Norshead Mansions made a veil. Both I and her former husband, Colin, who I know, helped her to move in. She appeared to be very happy, as did the children. In fact, the only person who was not happy was Colin, who had told her he was worried in case she could not afford to run the flat. During this time, I would see Sheila occasionally, certainly not every day. It was normally when she had a problem to be discussed. Sheila worried over the smallest of problems. And it is within my knowledge that before the birth of her sons, she was petrified that she could not have children. She also had a deep dislike of her stepmother, who apparently kept quoting religion at her. This would upset Sheila and annoy her. I would say that Sheila had a very quick and violent temper which she would lose over the simplest of things, although I have never seen her use physical violence towards anyone. About nine or ten months ago, Sheila changed. She became extremely depressed and withdrew into herself. She would not discuss all her problems, although whenever she visited her father, she would return even more depressed because of her stepmother. Apparently, the stepmother would preach to her about her boyfriends and how it was wrong that she would make love with them and that Sheila should always remember God. She gradually deteriorated until about three weeks before her first breakdown. Nicholas fell out of a taxi when she was returning home from her parents'. She blamed herself for this because she was not concentrating on what the children were doing, only on her mother's religious rantings. And it was shortly after this that she had her first breakdown. I feel certain that she had been building up to this for some time and that the accident was the final straw. Her parents arranged for Dr Ferguson from Harley Street, London, to treat her and she was admitted to hospital. She spent about three months receiving treatment, during which time I did not see her. Shortly before she came out of hospital, she telephoned me. She told me that, although she counted me as a good friend, in order for her to get back on her own feet, she felt we should not contact each other, as she would burden me with problems that she should work out for herself. She felt she had to have a period where she sorted out her own worries without help. I respected this, and did not have any form of contact. About a month after she came out of hospital, she telephoned me and told me she had a financial problem and could I call on her. I went to the flat a day or so after and gave her some money. She appeared well in herself, although you could see she'd not completely recovered. After this, I, I bumped into her a couple of times in clubs in London. She was with friends and apart from greeting each other, we hardly spoke. About four months ago, I called in on Sheila at her flat, at her suggestion. She appeared to me to be jumpy, uptight and panicky, although I do not know what about. Whilst I was there, she telephoned Tara, a, a close friend. She was apologising to Tara for a religious book that her stepmother had dropped off at Tara's house a couple of days previously. During the call, the phone went dead. Sheila suddenly became hysterical, mumbling about the phone being bugged. 
She became like someone possessed, ranting and raving. She was striking herself and beating the wall with her fists. I tried to calm her, but she did not seem to hear me. I became extremely frightened, not only for her, but for myself. She kept talking about the devil and God and stated that God was sitting opposite her. And unlike what her stepmother said, he in fact loved her. I contacted her, her ex-mother-in-law and I asked her to come round. This aggravated the situation and Sheila became even more violent and abusive. Her mother-in-law called and found a prescription for Sheila's drugs and asked me to get them for her. I went to the chemist and when I returned I was met at the front door by the mother-in-law who was leaving. She told me Sheila had kicked her out. I went in and tried to pacify Sheila but was unable to do so. I became extremely concerned for my own safety. I telephoned Sheila's doctor and a short while later one of her partners arrived. Sheila refused to let him examine her, shouting that he was trying to poison her. By this time she had become completely irrational. The doctor eventually left without being able to do anything. Being unable to do anything, I contacted another doctor who arrived shortly afterwards. Again, he was unable to do anything because Sheila would not allow him near her. He wrote a short note which he handed to me and asked me to hand to Sheila's GP and gave her a stronger drug. Whilst the first doctor was there, Tara's husband called to collect his daughter who was staying with Sheila. I had arranged this as I felt something nasty might happen. I was extremely scared for everyone's safety. At that time, I felt Sheila may use violence towards someone. During the night, I contacted Sheila's father and informed him of the situation. He said he would call and collect her in the morning. I asked if he could make it sooner, but he could not. It eventually got to the stage when I could no longer handle the situation. Sheila was behaving like a person, possessed, rambling about the devil and God. I went next door to her neighbour who came through. Sheila sat down and combed or, or brushed her hair. She had a blank expression on the face and was staring into space. Every now and again she would suddenly become violent again, ranting and raving, then stopping as quickly as it started when she combed her hair. This carried on until her father arrived in the morning and arranged for her admission into the hospital again. When her father walked into the flat, Sheila became a different person. She spoke to her father in a calm and collected manner. I, I could not believe the change in the girl. I handed her father the drugs which had been prescribed. Sheila spent about two months in hospital and when she came out I did not see her. I spoke to Tara, who told me she was all right, but not the same person. I'm aware that she started going out and had a number of boyfriends. The children at this time were being looked after by her ex-husband, Colin, for the majority of the time, and she had more free time for entertaining. I have visited Sheila on about ten occasions since she last came out of hospital. She was a completely different person being very slow and deliberate in her speech and, and difficult to converse with. I have seen her once, socially, since. This was last Friday, the 2nd of August 1985. I had been invited to a party in the flats where Sheila lives. I'd gone to Rags nightclub with a friend when Sheila came in. She asked me if I was going to the party. We had a discussion and a group of us went. We had a pleasant evening during which time she told me she was going to another party on the Saturday night with her ex-husband and that she was going to her parents' farm on the Sunday with the twins. I have not seen Sheila since I left the party. The first I knew about what had happened was when the reporters from the Daily Mail told me when I was at Sheila's flat checking it. She had asked me to do this while she was away as she was worried about it being burgled. I am extremely shocked about what has happened and find it difficult to believe. Had it just been her stepmother who had been killed, I, I could accept it as she disliked her intensely, but to think she has killed her father and children is difficult to comprehend. I spoke to Sheila about the night of the second breakdown and she could not remember anything about it. 
I feel she believed I had made it up. I would add, on that occasion, she could not recognise anyone who came to the flat, and she believed everyone was trying to hurt her or kill her.